Welcome everyone to our webinar tonight. I hope everyone's well. We're, we're just waiting on a few people. So far we've got about 40 people that have joined us. Just a few housekeeping things. Um, if, you, if you're new to our webinars, um, we'd kindly ask you, if you're not going to be speaking, just to mute yourself, just because it helps with the clarity of the audio. And also we don't want to hear conversations in the background when someone's speaking. In addition to that, we've got lots of information uh, to share tonight uh, with regards to dentistry work experience and how you can max maximize your time at home whilst um, dentistry work experience has been cancelled. So if you have a pen and paper at hand, uh, that'll be really, really useful to jot down any notes. Um, in addition to that, throughout the, throughout the slideshow presentation, there's going to be quite a few QR codes. Um, so these QR codes are basically links to really useful things that, that you can just pick up your phone and scan on the screen um, and they'll load onto a website or onto a, a sign up form. So if you do have your phone at hand, that'll be really, really useful. Um, in addition to that, we have a chat function. So if you have a look at your menu, there'll be a, an option to uh, trigger a chat. So if you have that at, um, if you have any questions, then please uh, please feel free to ask away anything you'd, you'd like to know. We've got a really experienced team uh, today on the panel who will be uh, guiding uh, you guys through this, the presentation and also answering any questions that you may have uh, with regards to uh, any concerns or doubts that you have regarding um, this topic. Now, you guys may see a, a poll on your screen. Um, we'd be really grateful if you could kindly fill that out. We've got about... Um, Two, two questions on there. Um, so if you um, can kindly sign, uh, fill that out, that'll be really useful for us. We'll shortly start the webinar in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for us, a few more people to uh, sign, uh, sign in. Um, for those of you who just joined this minute, um, this, the topic of this presentation is dentistry work experience, what to do if it's canceled. So we'll be covering so much information and we will be starting in a few minutes. For those people who have got questions regarding um, anything to do with dentistry really, um, please feel free to uh, access our chat and utilize that facility. I know the question that we get asked quite a lot is how long will this webinar last? Because I know that some of our previous webinars have gone on for quite a while. This one we aim to, to keep to around about 45 minutes to one hour um, because it's a relatively short uh, presentation, um, but we will be covering lots and lots of information uh, in lots of detail and um, if you guys have got any questions we'll be tackling those questions uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation um, so there's lots and lots of information so uh, really excited to, to, to be sharing this with everyone and uh, introducing our great team so thank you very much for those people who have uh, completed the questions what I'll be doing is I will be shortly starting the presentation. I see we've already got a few questions in the chat already. So fantastic. We'll be covering all of those questions uh, throughout the the presentation so thank you for all those questions so without further ado i'd like to introduce and welcome everyone to our dentistry work experience webinar um, what to do if it's cancelled this is primarily aimed at individuals wishing to study dentistry and obviously looking to do work experience um, but obviously due to the covid19 unfortunately many dental surgeons and clinics are running on skeleton staff not only that, but they're prioritizing emergencies. And with the limitations of PPE, not only nationally, but globally, we have to restrict um, exactly who we can provide that PPE to. And as a result of that, on the back of that, the, the, the risk to individuals coming in as volunteers is obviously too, too big to, to bring in as a work experience individual. So therefore that's why a lot of clinics have cancelled work experience, which is very unfortunate. But on the positives, uh, there's many, many things that we, you can do to maximise your time at home. 
and to gain dentistry career insight. So we'll be definitely covering those parts throughout the presentation. On the panel today, we have not only got students who are UK universities, but we have got qualified dentists as well as offer holders. So we've got a really diverse panel today. So we'll be covering a little bit about the, the organization. I went to be a dentist. We're going to be covering what counts as work experience, how to maximize your time during lockdown, five things that anyone can do to boost their dentistry career insight, how to get dentistry work experience and what to do during your work experience when eventually, hopefully, clinics do open. Um, and obviously we'll be covering some questions and the answers at the end. So who are we? We're a team of dentistry students, dentistry applicants, uh, sorry, dentistry students for dentistry applicants. That's exactly what, what we're here for. And we're comprised of uh, a diverse a range of uh, students from different universities around the UK. Our mission is really to help dentistry applicants through every, every stage. We, we really do mean that. And all of our team are so committed in delivering that. And I'm sure that from our webinars that we're, we're doing completely in our own time uh, for you guys, we really want to help you guys because we understand how it can be quite troublesome and sometimes you can feel in the dark. So we want to just cast a little bit of light and shine some light on this area. For those who have um, shown interest in our UCAT lessons, that's our first step. It's our first step towards helping you uh, whilst we're finalizing our website. The UCAT lessons, lessons are live for July. This is where you, you have a one-to-one, -one, well, sorry, a, a, a tutor who will give you uh, expert information and tips on the UCAT. And every single lesson will be so detailed covering each and every aspect of the UCAT. So for July, um, you'll be covering every single session um, for every single topic, uh, and every single section of the UCAT. Um, and as a result of that, you will definitely improve your confidence, improve your score, most likely. And in addition to that, you'll feel a lot better and um, you'll be raring to take the exam. Now with UCAT, many of you will know from our emails, they have actually announced that the, the exam will go ahead um, and they have advised students to actually sit the test as early as they can um, to minimize any uncertainties that COVID-19 uh, may present. Um, hopefully the exam won't get um, canceled, um, but obviously it's really important to try to um, follow their guidance as well. We also have a weekly um, sort of giveaway where we, whereby we're given away the book that we're soon to publish. And last week's winner, congratulations, was Iman Sadiq. That's their Instagram handle. So we'll be sharing that on the uh, Instagram uh, for this coming week. So in order to sort of win the free book, you just have to take an image of the screen, tag um, our, our Instagram handle, and just share the story. If your uh, profile is private, that's fine. Just send us a screenshot that you shared it, and that'll be really, really fantastic. Um, our book, just for those of you who may not known about it, it's the most up-to-date resource compiled by dentistry students uh, from the UK and also dentistry interviewers. Uh, it's for undergraduates and postgraduates. It contains tips on personal statements as well as 20 plus examples. There's UK and BEMA advice from a, a, an individual who's a tutor and an, uh, a, an actual expert at that. There's advice on widening participation, non-conventional entry, gap years, you name it, we, we've covered every single aspect that you could think of. Uh, and not forgetting, we cover typical dental school interview questions and scenarios to help prepare you in the best way possible. So without further ado, I'm gonna actually uh, hand over now to Fadila, who will be talking about what counts as dentistry work experience. Hi guys. Um, so basically, in terms of work experience, as you guys probably know, um, most universities require the minimum two weeks um, in a dental setting. But with COVID-19 going on, it's kind of um, more fluid than that. So a lot of you kind of DM me and are worried about the fact that, you know, there's no shadowing going on, your work experience being cancelled, like what to do now. Um, but I think the most important thing to remember is everybody's in the same boat now. So 
and given the whole COVID situation, universities, universities sorry, are um, bound to be more understanding um, with regards to that mandatory work experience. Um, and the minimum they're looking for is two weeks. So that can easily be compensated for um, with like online courses. Later on in this um, webinar, we're going to be discussing like different online courses and the different ways to undertake work experience. Um, so definitely stay tuned for that. Um, one of the main things I want to say is just to be fluid with the idea of what work experience is. So it's not just limited to observing or shadowing a dentist in a practice. Um, online courses and things like that definitely do count. Um, and also it's quality over quantity. So you don't just need to be, you know, going everywhere you can to get as many hours under your belt. It's how you reflect on the experience that you get and what skills you learn from it that will matter. So for example, um, on the next slide, I'm gonna go through kind of the work experience I had before, um, well, when applying. Um, so let's just go on to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah. So as you can see over here, I had quite a varied amount of work experience. So including like children's summer club, working in an adult disability center, working in a cafe, tutoring, working in a care home, things like that. So from all of the things listed here, there's only two things here that are actually directly related to dentistry. So you've got the dental laboratory and the general dental practice. So that's just clearly showing you don't need that dental work experience to gain the skills that you need to show universities that you're a worthy applicant. For example, in an adult disability center, I had to tailor my way of communicating with these adults to be able to simplify what I was trying to say and make them understand. So in that, you could be talking about how you've got communication skills needed as a dentist to speak to your patients. So it's basically all about how you reflect on your experiences and using those skills to kind of relate it to how that would work as a dentist. So yeah. Okay. Hello everyone. Oh, sorry, Cal. I'm Karen. <laughs> going to introduce you there. Uh, so. Brinda Singh Shergill, he is a student at the moment at Glasgow University. Um, in your fourth year, aren't you, Binny? Yeah, fourth going to my fifth. Fourth going to fifth. Um, so Binny's going to be talking about how to maximise your time during lockdown. I think this is a very re frequently requested subject and very topical at the moment. So um, I'm going to let uh, Binny talk about that now. Thanks, Cal, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Binny. So a few ideas that we've had, um, ways to maximize your time during lockdown, especially with COVID and the fact that, and um, Fadila's mentioned, Cal's mentioned, there's not really access to dental surgeries anymore for yourselves. So some ways that you can maximize this time. One of the ways is volunteering or charity work. I think that would be a really beneficial way. Firstly, when you're going for your interviews, when they ask you what you've done during COVID, which would probably be quite a common question, what you've done in the interim, to be able to say you've helped out, you've done something beneficial, and that puts you in a good stead and in good light um, and there's a lot of different charities open at the moment that actually need help so every area has got something going on so just look online find what's near you and try to join webinars just like this one you're on at the moment really really good resources so because everyone's actually indoors in lockdown and um, not being able to communicate webinars are vast at the moment there's always something going on that you can join so your knowledge base by the end of this COVID period actually will be a lot higher and if COVID wasn't around. So I think it's really beneficial to go on these webinars and actually join a lot of the courses that um, I want to be a dentist actually has going at the moment. In terms of manual dexterity, it's quite a common question. I think all of us have been asked by students before, what can we do to show it? How do we show it? Can this count? Can this count? Um, some examples of what people do, if they haven't done any um, manual dexterity skills before, is knitting, or cross stitching. They're quite quick things to learn and you can make something quite quickly and get quite into it. Really, really good for stress management as well, um, just to do something and make something by the end of it. Instruments, if you can play any instruments, fantastic. Keep going. If you can't and you're interested in doing something, maybe this is the time to pick up an instrument and learn. You have time now. And again, stress management, something different to get your mind off of um, work, it's actually a really, really good um, outlet. So any term, and anything you can do in terms of manual dexterity will be really, really beneficial. I've also put tooth morphology practice. Now, what I mean by that um, is ways that you can make teeth at home. So it sounds a bit weird, and that's fine. 
but tooth morphology is a very, very important subject within dentistry. You learn the differences, the subtle differences between different teeth in different areas. So being, being able to make something at home that represents a tooth, being able to understand how it looks, where different bits go, really, really important practice. Really good for, for example, let's say you use um, cheap equipment to do it. So all you need is a bar of soap and some carving equipment, so wax carving equipment, and you can mold that soap bar into a set of teeth. That is something you can easily take with you. You can start practicing to get better at um, and start showing off as well. So in your interviews, if you, if you get them, when you're going into practice, when you're going into give examples of manual dexterity, getting something out and showing a set of teeth, for example, is a lot quicker than taking a guitar with you and start playing a song, for example. So tooth morphology is really good, really, really good practice. And it's something that's relatable to dentistry when you go in there. So having that practice really, really beneficial. Uh, Okay, to the next slide. Perfect, now pass on to Catherine. Lovely, so I'm just gonna continue with what Binny was saying about maximizing your time during lockdown. Um, so as well as voluntary and charity work, um, any form of public facing job um, will give you a whole host of transferable skills. Um, so speaking to the admissions tutors at Newcastle, they'll also consider this as part of their minimum two weeks of work experience um, and many other unis will probably be the same. Um, so anything working in retail, supermarkets, cafes, restaurants all involve you interacting with customers and other team members and will provide various scenarios that you can talk about and reflect on in your personal statement um, and at interview. Other skills um, you can relate to both a part and full-time job include time management, leadership, responsibility, working under pressure, professionalism, decision making, problem solving and like so many more. Um, many companies have continued to hire during this time um, and now restrictions are starting to ease a bit then many more will probably be taking stuff on again as well. Um, some obviously won't so um, apply kind of anywhere and everywhere you can and hopefully you should be successful getting somewhere um, and as well as counting towards work experience getting a job can be really useful for helping to save up some money for uni as well. Um, so secondly, with all this time off, it's also a great opportunity to stay on top of current affairs and stuff within dentistry. Um, these especially are the sorts of things that could crop up at interview. Um, the biggest and most controversial topics are probably amalgam and fluoride. Um, so these are definitely worth researching. Um, you won't need to know the fine details of these, but make sure that you can form a sort of opinion on these and balance the arguments and think about possible solutions to these problems or how you'd explain, um, for example, the importance of fluoride to a patient who's um, quite against it. Uh, some great documents to research and be aware of are the nine GDC standards um, and the Public Health England document called Delivering Better Oral Health. Um, the latter one is like a really long document and you definitely won't be expected to know most of it, but it's quite a good place to, to start to find out some bits of information. Um, you can also take this research and reading to the next level by reading books and articles. Um, Binny's already mentioned about the great courses and webinars and things available um, at the moment, but there's also loads of books out there. Um, for articles, great places to go are the British Dental Journal, dentistry.co.uk, Dental Update, Nature Magazines, I think this is being mentioned later on as well. Um, so have a little browse and a read of something that really takes your fancy. Um, this is better if it's not too overcomplicated because you'll struggle to talk about this confidently in interviews if you don't really understand it. Um, in terms of medical books, in terms of dental books, there aren't as many as there are for like the medical specialities and stuff. Um, in sixth form, I read through some medical memoirs, which are really great to gaining an insight into healthcare in general and the wider concepts of patient care. Even if they're not directly dental related, these can still be like really useful. Um, examples of these include Breath Before Air, uh, This Is Going to Hurt, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, The Checklist Manifesto, Being Immortal, and any, of the, any other of the Atul Gawande books, um, and Trust Me, I'm a Junior Doctor. The Very Short Introduction series is also really good, especially the Medical Ethics book, um, and other book recommendations we have from the team that are more densely focused include the Dental Diet, The Smile Stealers, Black Box Thinking and Emotional Intelligence. Um, so don't feel obliged to read through any of these, just find something that interests you because um, it's only really worth talking about something at interview um, that you genuinely enjoyed. 
If mentioning any of these books in your personal statement, it's worthwhile trying to pick something out that's a bit different to talk about as well. Um, so next, finally on this slide, another really important thing is to do is thoroughly research all of the unis and cities that offer dentistry. Um, so there's 16 dental schools, two which are just graduate entry. Um, so it's not too challenging to give each one like a really good search and a really good research. Um, I'd say don't pay too much attention to the Guardian League tables or stuff like that because those change like really massively from year to year. So don't like base your decision solely on that. Really like look into the unis and cities themselves. Um, find out which course structure and teaching style you think would suit you best and which cities you're drawn to. Um, this is going to be your home for the next five years. Um, try and find some unique features about the ones that you want to apply to as well as this will really show you've done your research when it comes to the interview. Um, so on to the next slide. Um, so if you're still in school, make sure you're on top of all your notes from year 12 um, so that you're ready to start year 13. I'd say it's probably too early to start revising and preparing too much for year 13, but organising everything and making sure you're ready to go will make starting back at school again a lot easier. Um, and the final point from me is to get in contact with dentists and dental students to find out more about the profession. Um, so try giving your local dentist a call or drop one of us a DM on Instagram. Uh, we're all more than willing to help and I think I can say the same on behalf of the majority of the <coughs> majority of the profession so just ask away um, especially if you haven't been able to ask these questions during work experience um, it's so important to be aware of all the pros and cons of the profession before you commit to studying it so yeah really good to ask these questions um, I think Benny's got one final point uh, yeah thanks for that Catherine and um, just a final point for me is take a break so <laughs> I know everything's geared towards what can you do, try to do more, um, try to do this, try to do that. But bear in mind as well, this is a great time for everyone to de-stress, to reprioritize things. So don't feel you have to do a range of different things in all this time and just keep getting yourself busy, 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 busy. Be able to have blocks of time that's just for you where you can de-stress and relax. Um, it's a really, really important time for mental health as well. So make sure you have that time. Um, and that's, it. that's my final point. I'll give it back to Cal. Thank you very much. That was very useful. So um, I'm now going to hand it on to Harriet, who is also a student at a Newcastle University. Um, Harriet's going to be talking about things that anyone can do to boost their dentistry career insight. Hi, guys. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few things that um, are free to look at on the internet and um, which you can boost your dentistry career insight and um, so the first thing I would recommend is going on to these six websites although there's a lot more out there and um, so dentistry.co.uk is a UK based dental news website and it discusses a range of current topics in dentistry and um, a lot of the resources are free to access and I recommend looking at the oral health section the news section and the COVID-19 section so you're up to date on those um, and there's also a link to what's called the Dentistry Study Club. And that's a range of webinars that have been put on over the last couple of months. And there's some good webinars that you could join for free. Um, the BDA is a, the trade union for dental professionals. Um, and that gives a lot of advice and guidance to dental professionals. Um, they've also got a coronavirus section. So I reckon that will come up quite a lot in the interviews as something to talk about. So I would have a little look at that section. Um, they also have a students uh, section on the website, so have a little link onto that and um, that shows all the resources available to stu dental students. Um, they also have an official journal called the BDJ. Um, although you won't be able to access the articles on there as you're not a member, they do have short summaries at the top. Um, and these are all uh, opinion pieces and current research in dentistry, so that's good to have a little look around of what they're posting at the minute. There's also the GDC, which is the regulator of the dental profession. Catherine mentioned a couple of uh, resources on there. So the standards of professionals in dentistry and also the scope of practices are available on there. So I download those and definitely give those a read over because there's something that's, that comes up time and time again in interviews and it's really good preparation. Obviously, we've got the I want to be a dentist.com website, which is launching very soon. And um, this has ample amounts of free resources about applications. Um, and I'd also mention um, having a little look at the dental schools websites as well, which we have links to on that website. Um, and then finally, the dental school council 
um, which represents dental schools across the UK and Ireland. Um, and that has a good section on studying dentistry and the process of applying if you needed anything summarized. Um, online learning, sorry, Carl, next slide. Um, so online learning, there's a couple of websites as well. Um, so Revised Dental, that's, that's a new website. Um, it's, it's made by dental students for dental students. Um, and there's small bite sized chunks of information uh, to help students revise in a range of topics. Um, it's, it's quite simply um, put, so you'd probably be able to understand some concepts from that. Um, Future Learn is a great website for a load of different things, um, but they do have a Discover Dentistry course, which is run by the University of Sheffield. It is six weeks long, um, but you can put as much or as little time into the course as you want and skip through different weeks. Um, and that's free to access, as is the Carceria um, website, which is run by Michigan University mainly. Um, and they have a really good section on introduction to dental medicine. And also, as was mentioned at the start of this webinar, um, there's a dentistry experience course that will be running soon, um, which has a lot of information um, that you can have a little look at too. Next slide, Carl. <laughs> Sorry. Um, social media wise, um, be wary of social media because there's a lot of information out there, but it's also opinion and not fact check. So take everything with a little pinch of salt. Um, but having said that, it's a great resource, resource for networking with current students at your university that you're applying for. And there's a lot of clinicians uh, there as well. So you can send messages to people and most people are quite happy to reply and give advice. Um, on Instagram, there's lots of cases and um, people put up in what's called Instagram TVs and um, lots of talks about different topics in dentistry. And like I said, people to talk to as well. If you go onto dental students profiles, they put up a lot of resources and links to web, uh, websites and blogs all the time um, and pages for mentoring as well. Um, YouTube, again, there's lots of interesting videos. Check out our uh, YouTube page for the webinars that we've had in the past if you haven't seen those yet. Um, and there's specific experiences by students at different universities so that gives great insight into their experiences. Um, and then obviously Facebook and Twitter, but um, in my opinion, there's not as much information on those two platforms as there is on YouTube or Instagram. Um, and then podcasts, I'm quite an auditory learner, so I don't read that many books other than what's on Audible. Um, so podcasts are a really good place to get um, information from. These are my top five dentistry podcasts. So BDS and Beyond was actually set up by Newcastle students. Um, there's a specific podcast on there about getting into dental school and it's run by our admissions advisor. So if you were thinking about applying to Newcastle, that's a great place to have a little look and read about, uh, read about, listen about. <laughs> um, the Dental Leaders podcast. And um, that discuss, uh, discusses a range of topics with leaders in the dental field. Um, it's really informative about career pathways and life in general, but not lots of insight into dentistry per se. Um, the Dental Head Start podcast, that's got some useful episodes on prioritised com communication. Um, but again, it's about students going into, um, after they've graduated uni and going into their first job. Um, Off the Cusp is um, a new podcast, so there's lots of discussions about post-COVID um, lockdown dentistry and how that will affect dentistry in private versus NHS, um, so check that out. And then the Producive um, Dental Podcast, there's some quite difficult concepts on there, so avoid anything that says occlusion. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of podcast um, episodes on there about passion and values in dentistry with Drew Shah, who's an amazing um, speaker and then 12 rules for dentistry gives a good insight on how what dentistry is like as a graduate um, next slide sorry um, and then these are just my five top tips for looking into and doing your own research if you have a little bit of spare time so dboh Catherine's mentioned previously that's delivering better oral health um, that's a Bible for paediatric dentistry and in fact we're probably told to learn this document off by heart for our final exams. It's the basis for all the preventative advice we give our patients and is a good foundation for dental practice. Um, I would look into arguments for and against using fluoride and why the, uh, those opinions exist. Um, I'd have a think about what discussions you would have with your patients about fluoride. 
what concentrations there are in toothpaste, what's recommended and the science behind fluoride as uh, Catherine touched on as well. Um, skill mix is about the different scopes of practice of the dental team. So check that out on the GDC website, how you can utilize dental therapists, how you can utilize a nurse in your practice, et cetera. Um, local smile campaigns. So across the UK, different areas have different smile campaigns. So where I'm from in Cumbria, the campaign was called Smile for Life. And in Newcastle, there was a Sugar Smart campaign. So if you just Google your local area or the uh, dental school area you're applying for and oral health campaigns, you should get some quite interesting information up about that. Um, and then the age old question, private versus NHS. You definitely need to have a, a clear understanding of the differences between private dental care and NHS driven dental care. Um, why different treatments exist, what the different banding systems are in NHS dentistry, different materials that they might use, and there's different treatment options like implants mainly are provided in private care. So I would have a little look and see if you can compile a table with differences between those two. Um, and that's mine. I'm just going to check if there was anything in the chat box. So someone asked what DBOH stood for. That Yeah, we covered that. Yeah. Right. If anyone else has any other questions, just type them now. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was fantastic, Harriet. No Lots of information there. We've got a question on what does DBOH stand for? So that's delivering better oral health, I think. And I might have replied to that. Yeah. Fantastic. So we now bring you on to how can I get work experience? So obviously thinking ahead and thinking positively um, should dental practices open up in the, in the future for individuals wishing to partake in uh, observation and shadowing um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, clinical work experience in the dental practice but also how you can think outside the box and how you can actually gain um, a lot from exper experiencing different um, environments so a region I'm going to allow you to take the lead here. Okay, thank you, Cal. So guys, I'm going to be talking about how you can get work experience during this time. Um, so obviously, like we've said previously, you can't really go in a dental practice with everything going on. Um, so the first point I want to make is previous experiences you might have had. So like Fadila mentioned before, there was only two experiences she had out of everything else that linked directly to dentistry, but you might have done something else where you learned skills that can be transferable to dentistry. So examples of these skills might be good communication, empathy, and things like that. And examples of places of work might be a charity shop, retail in a care home. And you can also use other experiences to talk about these skills. For example, if you're a head girl or a head boy at your school, or if you have some sort of role. And also if you're part of a community, and this can be anything ranging from religious to um, helping out community or anything like that. And what I wanted to do is just ask um, some of our team members what they did uh, when they were near 12 or 13 that would be linked uh, where they gain skills that they could link in their personal statement. So, uh, Raza, can you give me an example of something you did? Yeah, and sure. What you learned so, from it? Yeah. So on my gap year, I actually decided to decide that I was going to do a job part time. Um, so I got a job uh, at Specsavers. Now, at first, uh, you don't see the link between opticians and dentists, but actually, if you think about it, we're still working with NHS. Um, you get a lot of patients coming in, which you have to, you know, guide through the whole uh, practice itself. And then you get to, it's quite similar to um, the chain of command almost. So I'm playing the role of like a dental nurse, but in an optician setting. Um, so that's one way I linked it in, as well as, um, like I just mentioned, through NHS, paperwork, patient confidentiality. So these are some of the things that I picked up um, during my like first initial job and then developing skills like talking to people when they're not having the best of days and then you get some different types of patients you know uh, medical problems and yeah so through my job I was able to pick up these types of skills and develop my interpersonal skills talking to different people having that responsibility of sometimes you're you're the only one on the shop floor 
um, and you get, you know, all of a sudden there's a line of patients just coming in and customers with different queries. Um, so I think it's quite varied, but that was just my personal experience. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's really useful to identify how your current job may link into dentistry because it's just like the simple things like talking to people, being confident, um, you know, developing your personality as you go along the way. So I think these type of things really um, l allowed me to uh, progress further um, as a dental student um, to be. So I think, yeah, so th throughout the, throughout in normal days, it would consist of like talking to patients, but sometimes I would also, you know, pick up the phone and so stuff like that. I, I just link that in in my personal statement. So yeah, that's one way I did it through my job at Sex Savers. Okay, thank you for that, Raza. And I also wanted to ask um, Catherine, what have you done and what did you learn from that? Um, hi, yeah, so I um, did lifeguarding um, in sick form um, and I mentioned this when I was applying. Um, so this is obviously um, uh, a job where you have like a lot of responsibility. Um, so it was good talking about that as well as like managing my time. Um, between doing that and studying um, and doing like a couple of other bits as well. Um, so there's definitely all sorts that you can link into a variety of like different things. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Catherine. So I hope those two examples showed you that um, you are able to link lots of different things to dentistry. It doesn't have to be directly in a dental clinic. Um, so moving on, our, our detailed dentistry work experience course will be coming soon. And this will be 100% free and it's a variety of different videos where we'll be talking about different things that go on in um, the dental clinic. And this is a great tool for you to learn from and you can make notes while you're watching the video. And if you learn anything from that, you can link that in your personal statement or speak about it in your interview. Um, an important thing to mention is make notes and don't just think about what you saw think about what you learned from that so make reflections on it that and next up so youtubers and bloggers so we mentioned this briefly before as well a good idea is to watch their videos or read their accounts on what a career in dentistry entails and think about what they're doing in a day in the life and use this to make pros and cons um that they mention because of course it's really important to recognize that there are cons in the career as well despite this why would you still want to go into the career so it's really useful to look into these and on the next slide i have a bunch of examples that i will go through with you and next up we have volunteering so you could actually do this from home as well or around you so if you have an elderly neighbor or someone who's um, less able can you be helping them during these times for example, doing their weekly shop or uh, just checking up on them every now and again. And also, have you searched online for volunteering opportunities in your area or online? So the next slide, I'm gonna talk about some examples. Okay, so for YouTubers and bloggers, I've found a few examples for you. Some of them are from an American perspective, but they still might be relevant. So these are them. And I've got some blogs as well for you, some articles. The last one is quite good as it, as it gives you kind of the perspective from a student, like what it's like in clinics. And that might be a useful insight for you. And for volunteering opportunities, if you are going to be helping a neighbor out, Sainsbury's has this um, volunteer shopping card where you can use the shopping card kind of like a gift card but they would top it up from their own house. Like um, they would top it up themselves. So that's a good way to like do the shop without having direct contact with them. And these are some other websites where you can search for volunteering opportunities. Um, the Be My Eyes app is really good because it links you with someone who um, has uh, difficulties in seeing and you can help them out. And the adopt a grandparent, a grandparent campaign is also a really good one because it links you with someone who's elderly, uh, who might not have contact with family members or something like that. So these are just some examples that you can check out. 
and I hope that helps you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Lots of useful uh, nuggets of information there uh, to sort of think outside the box. Um, so what we're going to do now is talk on about a really, really important topic, which is actually how to gain the most out of your work experience when you do actually uh, immerse yourself into that. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Chowdhury for this. So hi guys, my name is Anam. Um, I've just recently graduated from the University of Birmingham, and I'm just going to speak about what to do when you're when to do during your work experience and how to actually get the most out of your work experience. Um, so my slide is ba is about if you're lucky enough to get the actual dental work experience, and I would suggest that you try and get um, work experience even at, even after you've applied. Any experience is good. Um, so the first tip was really immerse yourself in the role. You're only there for a couple of. You only be there for a couple of days, for a few weeks, and so it's really, really important to really immerse yourself, to ask questions. Um, if you're not confident, fake your confidence, and also, um, and you mostly when you're doing my experience, you're just observing. However, sometimes the dentist will allow you to do certain things. So while I did my work experience, I was allowed to go and call patients from the waiting room. I was allowed to mix like some of the impression materials, and that's just because I asked. So if you don't ask, you won't get. So ask them questions, ask them questions about procedures, ask them questions about things that they don't, that you don't understand. Ask them questions about their role, um, pros and cons as well is also really, really important. Um, and when the dentist notices that you are actually engaged, that you're asking questions, they're more likely to help you as well. Uh, so that's, that was mainly the first point. Um, my second point was, and I think also Harriet spoke about shared roles. Um, so it's important to realize that dentistry is not an isolated profession. Um, it's a team, it's all about teamwork. And it, you, as when you're in a dental practice, you're a part of a much wider team. So everyone from the receptionist to the nurse has a really important part to play. So it's really important that you understand the roles and responsibilities of not only the dentist, but also people that work alongside the dentist. And um, to speak to everyone in the practice, gain their perspectives, what do they do? And you can reflect upon that in your work experience and it shows that you're, you are insightful. It shows that you've gone the extra mile as well and it helps you decide whether dentistry is the right career path for you. Um, my third point was pay, uh, pay close attention to the dentist. So when you're doing um, the work experience, make sure you are paying close attention to the dentist. So try and put yourself in the dentist's shoes um, look at what they're doing look at how they could look at what they do day to day look at what skills and attributes they draw on in, um, during their job are they are they a good communicator are you a good communicator is that a skill that you know that makes you feel like dentistry is for you or is that something that you need to try and work on before your interview and your application um, so make sure you take notes of what a good dentist is and if you were able to witness that throughout your work experience as well um, and make sure you try and draw upon skills needed to become a good dentist and um, draw upon your own experiences and do you have those skills as well and then my last point on this side was to make notes on specific encounters or challenges that you may have witnessed during your work experience so as well as having a general overview um, of dentistry it's really important to focus on specific examples of what drew you into dentistry. So look for a case or a particular patient that you can, um, that you can reference in your, um, in your personal statement. So for me, when I did my work experience, um, I saw that the dentist was dealing with an anxious patient and I saw how they took an anxious patient um, and how it, she, wasn't able to, she wasn't able to sit in the chair and then throughout the appointment, he was actually able to do a treatment on her. And so I used, so that's what drew me into dentistry. And then I put that into my personal statement and I referenced that during my interview. Um, and I thought that was quite useful as well. Uh, so make specific, so make sure you make, take notes of any challenges or any encounters that you may have witnessed as well. Um, and then can you just go to the next slide, Cal? But I think the most important thing is the reflection. Uh, so when as dental students and as dentists, as, a, as dentists, we use reflection, we reflect upon our treatment, we reflect upon our um, strengths, what went well, what didn't go well every single day. And the dental and dental schools are looking for an applicant that's going to be, that's reflective upon their work experience. So it's almost not, 
important how much work experience you do, it's more important what you gain from the work experience. Um, and we've mentioned that throughout the webinar, but make sure this is just a separate slide just to really hone in that it's very important for you to reflect upon your work experience. And um, so I've put in a few tips on here as well. So creating a personal portfolio, so have a portfolio of what you've done, what work experience have you done, how long did you do it for, where did you do it. It's really important to draw upon this because you'll begin to forget as you go through the application process. And then when, as you're doing the work experience, keep um, a diary with you and reflect and read about your experiences. So just have, um, and sorry, so input your experiences straight away. So as when you have the work experience, make sure you write down something interesting, um, and write it down straight away so that you don't forget it. And then when you go home at the end of the day, read up on it and reflect about what you may have learned, what you need to go and do further research about as well. And then it's really important to go back and revisit your reflection diary um, to make sure. So go back after a week and try and update it. And then before you know, you've got you've got examples of work experience that you can use in your personal statement and in your interview as well. Um, so go back to your reflection and keep on adding to it as well. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see that I've put in a reflective diary. So that could be something that you could be doing, filling in right now. Um, so what have you done? So you could put in your webinar, what have you learned? Has anything surprised you about dentistry? Um, what have you gained? What skills and attributes do you think that you have as well? So it's really useful to have a log of what you've been doing right now, um, just as evidence so you can show to the university as well. And I think that's it. Um, that's all from me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end or in the chat function. I hope it was useful. But if you don't understand anything, just just give us just pop a question in the chat. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. So um, that ties us nicely into the the last part of the presentation, which is simply um, tying up what we've talked about. Um, We've obviously covered quite a lot of information today, so hopefully that has been very, very useful for you. Um, please do feel free to answer, um, ask us any questions. I believe we've got a couple of questions, so I'm going to kindly get, um, I'm going to go through the questions now and we're going to just answer a few of them. So, one question that we got was from an individual who was, um, slightly worried about their their sort of um, grades with regards to getting the right required grades for dentistry. So what I think we should do is, Addy, um, you can maybe talk a little bit about um, how individuals can prepare tips that you, you, you sort of would um, suggest to help with revision strategies and maximizing and, 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 and sort of boosting their, their grades? Yeah, so um, I understand being worried um, with grades, um, obviously playing on year 12 or year 13, I'm assuming year 12. Um, like they mentioned before, I think the key is just making sure your notes are up to date with your year 12 work and doing some prep for year 13 as well, because obviously year 13 is a very stressful year um finding some online resources um when i was in year 12 and year 13 i think there's a call like physics and maths tutor and stuff like that i use quite a lot of those websites so i struggled with um stuff like maths i didn't do too well in my mocks and stuff like that so i had to go and find some extra resources and um do lots of extra past papers lots of old past papers as well um i asked for some tips from my teachers as well is there anything they could help me out or point me in the right direction um and yeah, just trying to stay organised on top of that, because obviously when you get to year 13, hopefully you'll be getting interviews and stuff like that. That stuff builds up and you will get very busy and your schoolwork might take a knock. So it's probably better with this time that you have in lockdown, trying to be organised and getting sort of a head start, if that makes sense. Fantastic. And I mean, this is a question to everyone on the team. With regards to if, if you if you think that actually you've done all that and you really tried your best, but you just don't feel that you can meet the entry criteria, um, what options you know can, can there be initially? I know there's quite a lot of things to consider, but what could they could, could an individual consider? 
For one, they could, I mean, we've got a variety of different people who've taken different routes, like Binny's uh, graduate entry, but myself, I took uh, a gap year and um, it wasn't because of my grades. It was just that I didn't um, get an offer. So I think it's important to weigh the situation you're in because it will be different. It might turn out that you end up with AAA. So it's it, it's equally as important as if you keep up your belief that you're gonna get into dentistry. Now, once you've made up your mind uh, that dentistry is a career for you, then I'd recommend there's plenty of different pathways into dentistry. Um, and if you really wanna become a dentist, eventually you will, but it's just, it might take you longer than some other people. So you might have to do another graduate course or reset your a-levels that's a potential option people do get in that way but i think it comes down to the dedication that you're willing to put in and how long you're initially meant you how long you can wait and it might turn out that you may not even get any offers a second time round. but then you might have to go through graduate entry so there's plenty of different routes here but it just depends on what situation you're in exactly if you know what I me mean. we've had a question a few questions regarding um the ucat um, so one of the questions was, do you think August is too late to start to revise? I, mean, I can mention that, yeah. So um, we've said before that usually about six to eight weeks we recommend for um, revising for the UCAT. Um, that can be even shorter if you're probably revising longer in the day. That's probably six to eight weeks doing a an hour or so of revision um, each day. Um, so definitely not too late to start revising for August. Um, it's just about how much work you put in. Absolutely. Um, I think that six to eight weeks is, is the quoted example for individuals who have done it success, who have achieved a good score. Um, it gives enough time to cover the topics um, and it prevents you from over, but sort of burning out. I think uh, that gives you enough time to pace yourself. And statistics show that those who, you know, do partake in online um, sort of mock tests and do questions are likely to score higher. Um, we obviously have our UCAT e-lessons, uh, which you can sort of have a look into with the barcode that's on the screen at the moment. Um, another question we got was, um, would a band one score compensate for a low UCAT score? Um, do you... Raza, do you want to touch upon that? Some universities look at it differently. Some universities are very consider the SJT, which is the situational judgment test, um, you know, as just an indicator. Um, and it's clearly stated on their website that the SJT may or may not be considered, but it just looks um, what university you're looking to apply for. Some universities consider the test holistically, um, and they may say that if you're below a band two for the SJT, they may not even consider you. Um, where some universities say they they want your overall um, UCAT score to meet meet the year's threshold, um, uh, yeah. So it just depends on what university you're looking at, looking to apply to. Um, any information regarding the exact UCAT statistics could be found online uh, through their web pages. And um, if you really want an in-depth explanation, it may be worthwhile emailing uh, the admissions team for that. Yeah, really useful. Um, so Arij um, would like to talk about GCSE grades because I think we've got quite a few questions regarding GCSE grades and um, sort of the application process and acceptance. Um, yeah, so I can see a lot of you are asking like, do GCSEs matter and all of that? So um, if you go onto each university's website and you go onto dentistry, they will have the requirements there. And most of them will require um, for example like this many b's to a's stars for example but each university is dif different so you need to check their website for more detail on that and also someone asked would good gcse's and a levels and a pers personal statement compensate for a bad ucat so this is also dependent on the university so places like king's um king's college london they take a holistic approach when they're looking at who to invite for their interview so they will take into account your GCSE grades your personal statement your predicted grades and your um, um, experiences for example but somewhere like Bart's Queen Mary they would just look at your 
UCAT and your predicted grades. So it is dependent on the university and they will mention this on their website underneath the requirements. So I hope that clears that up. Yes, very useful. Um, so we've got another question for Adi. So what um, is the best thing to do between now and the start of the application cycle? Uh, just which um, year are they talking? Did you talk in general or? I think pr pr presumably this next coming cycle. So for two and uh, Yeah. Um, so I would say mainly before applying, basically what we've talked about. So obviously start preparing for your UCAT. Um, obviously that's coming in the next few months. So if you have time, I would start now. I know that myself, I probably could have started revising a little bit earlier and it probably would have helped as well. Um, personal statements, obviously you didn't need to start that too early, but start just, what I did was just write down everything I did, just a list of like any volunteering jobs, achievements, as small as they be, and I just wrote them on a list. Um, so that means I had something to go off when I started writing my personal statement. Obviously revising, starting preparing your notes, like we said, um, looking to work experience, like we speak spoke about today. Um, and yeah, just mainly that kind of stuff, because obviously the application process is coming up not too far away. So I think if you just start making lists, start getting a to-do list of everything to do with work experience, personal statement, UCAT, anything like that, it will just be a lot more helpful and you'll feel a lot more organised going forward. Really useful, really useful and information there. Um, I think at the moment, yeah, a lot of the things that we've talked about are definitely something that can things that can be actioned um, without necessarily um, gaining uh, clinical experience. So I'm going to direct this question to Harriet. Um, we've had a question with regards to what universities do the U do, do the SJTs. So what I believe that this individual's asking is um, is the SJT a requirement for all universities? So Harriet, do you want to just shine some light on um, on how the SJT actually fits in to the UCAT? So I think Razan maybe touched on that a little bit. He was saying that um, some universities, I don't actually know which ones, you'll have to look at the universities themselves, but some of them dis like don't really use the SJT as part of the UCAT, um, whereas others do, but I don't actually know specifically which universities do and don't. A good backup, if you don't want to do the SJT, um, <laughs> with the amount of questions that we're getting about it, mm -hmm. um, a good backup is always to do the BMAT. I mean, you have Leeds Dental School, and it's just one other exam that you have to sit. Um, so yeah, maybe consider that um, as a good option. Uh, if you don't do that well in your UCAT, we'll have BMAT e-lessons as well, if people are interested in that. But I think um, another thing that I quickly wanted to mention was about work experience in regards to, um, so I got a private message saying, is it worth me doing work experience in like a medical practice as well? And my answer to that would be yes, get as much as work experience as you possibly can. Because if you're in your interview and they say to you, well, why do you want to do uh, dentistry and not medicine? Well, you can say, look, I've uh, undergone some work experience as well. But I found that the, the right one, um, the right career for me was dentistry. So as long as you've done your research around different careers, um, then you can be fully sure that dentistry is a career for you because medicine and dentistry, the first three years and the workload um, and student life is pretty much similar. Um, so that's a, a very often uh, a question which is asked um, at some potential interviews and you don't want to um, limit your chances by just solely doing dental work experience. So just try and vary your work experience around all the different healthcare professions as much as you can because um, it'll only benefit you in the long run. Another question that we have got is what did you what did anyone do if they didn't get in the first time round? How did you improve gap years, etc? So I took a gap year. Um, the way I improved was um, I was pretty I was proactive in terms of um, you know setting out a goal as what I wanted. 
um, and which was to get an offer. And um, what I did was I secured a job. Um, as long as you use your gap year uh, wisely, there's not much that could go wrong with it. As long as you get more work experience, improve your application, be honest and see where you went wrong, whether it was your personal statement or you didn't meet the grades the first time round and you wanted to reset. Um, so yeah, just focus your time wisely. And if you use your, per, um, your gap year um, to improve your application, um, so for me, I, I wanted a better personal statement the second time round. So I invested more time into it. I wanted a better UCAT and a BMAT score. So I put more effort and uh, started a bit earlier than I perhaps did the first time round. Um, so those are just some of the things that I did. But if you want to make your gap year productive, it's good to have a plan. Um, know where you want to apply. Um, because you are taking a gap year, some universities may not consider it if you're retaking. So do your research around the career and have some solid points uh, of what you exactly want to achieve out of the year. I also think it's important to like, realise that you can ask the university where you went wrong. You can, there's no harm in like, ringing up the admissions and asking why did you, like, where did I go wrong, why did you reject I me? Mean, then you have a basis of which you can work on um, and then you can, you'll be able to exclude universities according to what they say as well. But I think a lot of applicants don't realise that you can you can ask them. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, gaining useful feedback from your uh, application, your interview is extremely valuable should you wish to reapply. So definitely, definitely uh, agree with you there. Um, and certainly something that I would um, encourage for any individuals wishing to, if that they do come across that scenario, then it's definitely worth uh, gaining some feedback. So other questions that we are having are what are the key points to include in your personal statement? Now we actually do cover that in our YouTube video uh, which is a recording of the webinar which will be released so the YouTube channel is I want to be a dentist so please do feel free to um, subscribe to that because we will be actually uploading all of these webinars onto that so everyone can watch that for free. we just got another question in the chat would some universities not like or even consider you if you took a gap year then reapply then reapply um so i think it depends on the university they all have their different entry requirements um there's many alternatives um and different pathways that you should consider before you take the gap year um a whether what went wrong was it simply your grades or you didn't meet your offer um, maybe good to contact the university if you did get an offer the first time round to say, um, look, I, I didn't get the grades. Is there something I can do in terms of that? And some universities may actually say, look, um, you, you missed out on the grades. So we'll hold your offer until next year. And if you can get the grades, um, yeah. So it just solely depends on what universities you're looking at. Um, they all have, um, they all have their own differences with their entry requirements, but, I would suggest do your research around that. Um, we do have a standard entry table and a non-standard entry table, uh, which will be out on our website as a completely free resource, which you can look up, compare the different um, universities' entry requirements um, and see whether, you know, if you've got like, let's say you've got like five GCSEs, what that limits you to, how you could eventually end up in dentistries through certain routes. So that's pretty much uh, how we've summarized it. But yeah, um, in terms of that question, I think it depends on the universities, like we've said before, but um, it's always good to keep your options open and see, um, you know, read, read. I think they have um, a dental admissions PDF on pretty much each university where they outline um, what they consider in each applicant. So have a read through that. Uh, it might turn out that some universities that you applied to last year and didn't get the offer for, if you put them down as your first choice, uh, they still may allow you to reapply. So yeah, those are just some things I found out while researching and there's plenty more information out there. Just gonna direct a question to Binny. Um, some universities, do some universities not like um, where if uh, an applicant takes a gap year then reapplies? What's, what's um... Yeah, no problem, I'll answer that. Um, so they don't mind the gap year as long as you've done something in that year with your system of dentistry. 
So if in that time period, for example, you uh, had, let's say, a retail job or something quite simple, you worked through this 12 month period and then you reapplied and you said 12 months you've had communication, you've had et cetera, et cetera, the transferable skills, but that decision has helped shape or help support your decision of wanting to do dentistry further, or sorry, wanting to do dentistry, then fantastic. Obviously you said you've taken a gap year and you just want to do dentistry and you've not really said anything about the gap year, then I think it can look quite negative. But yeah, there's there's nothing wrong with taking a gap year. Fantastic. I totally uh, agree with that. I think that universities um, absolutely don't have any problems with that. Um, obviously, it's very important to show um, what you intend to do, um, because that sometimes is required by university. So I would certainly advise those individuals wishing to pursue a gap year to contact the universities beforehand, because sometimes on the personal statement, they may require you to actually give some detail as to your uh, plans for the forthcoming gap year as well. So that's really, really important. A few more questions. Um, I just want to quickly add, um, because we get a lot of um, subject, like individual questions, we do have a service on our website, which we schedule a free uh, dentistry call um, with a careers advisor. So what we'll do is talk you through um, what some of the things that you actually can do in terms of uh, yourself to maximize your chances to get into dental school. And that will be based on your specific application, uh, should you wish. It's completely free and it will be available on our website. Uh, like Cal mentioned before, we want to do everything we can to help you maximize your chance, chances of getting into dental school. And that's just one of the services that we have. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll let you continue. Yeah, so we've got some questions uh, regarding um, the interviews, actually. So we are actually going to be doing a, a dedicated webinar on this subject because it's a huge subject. Um, but for the sake of uh, your question, we'll certainly cover some of that, those points. So what are the best ways to prepare for interview questions and MMI interviews? So with one of the panel who has undertaken an MMI if you wish to share some generic advice. Um, so I did an MMI interview for both Liverpool and Leeds um, and I think what I did beforehand was kind of just looking at what generic interview stations they might have um, and kind of practicing those with like a friend or somebody at home. Um, so for example, for Leeds, I was aware that there would be like a manual dexterity station. Um, so for that, I practiced like some origami and it turned out in my interview, I had to do some origami after all. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd just say, look, look online, have a look around and see what kind of stations would tend to show up and then just kind of practice accordingly, practice talking in a mirror, um, practice with your speaking style, just like kind of raise your confidence for the day. And then on the day itself, just remember with each station, you're starting afresh. So even if you feel like you didn't do so well on one station, the next station kind of raises spirits again and just go in, it's fresh again. You've got someone new to kind of impress. There's so many first impressions you're making, even if you feel like, you know, one didn't go as well as you would have wanted it to, you've got the next kind of make up for it. Um, yeah, so I can think of right now. Excellent. You also you could, um, a, lot of a lot of interview questions are very topical. Um, so you'll have similar questions about fluoride. Um, we mentioned that in the webinar as well, about amalgam. Um, so you could use this time to look around dental news, uh, look at what's topical, what's coming up, because that's more likely to come up in your interview as well. Um, so you could use that time, use your time to, to get, do more research about that. Fantastic, really useful advice there. Now, in addition to that, we also have some questions regarding um, if a, so this is an interesting one. So if a student with a perfect application, um, can, can, a perfect, can a student with a perfect application still be rejected solely because of limited spaces? How likely is this? I think that's a, a very, very, um, it's a, it's a very specific question, and I, in, my, in my opinion, um, firstly, I think that any application can, can have flaws. So I, I don't believe that there's always a perfect application because there's always something that someone can improve. However, you can make it a standing, standing 
uh, an application that stands out. I, I agree with that. In terms of your application being rejected solely because of limited spaces, I would suggest that for those individuals who put a strong application in, the chances of them getting a rejection due to limited space is extremely unlikely, uh, simply because strong applications will be noticed and strong applications will be recognized. And, and, and it's most likely that those in individuals will be, um, will be granted um, you know, what they deserve. So I, I, I think that in terms of rejection based solely on, on limited space, I think that uh, that's very unlikely. So I hope that answers your question. In addition to that, um, we've got a question here. Would an applicant have an advantage in their application if they have managed to complete some work experience compared to other applicants who didn't? Catherine, do you want to touch upon that? You're our work experience expert. Oh, I wouldn't quite say I'm an expert, um, but I'd say it's not about what you do, it's about how you reflect on it. So if someone's done um, a load of dental work experience and they've reflected on it really well and they've picked up some really great points from it um, and you haven't really done a lot and you've not really taken anything from it then of course the other person is going to be advantaged um, but if someone does weeks and weeks and weeks of work experience but they learn nothing from it they don't really write much that's interesting in their personal statement um, and they're just listing off what they've done then the admissions tutors are just going to look at this and are just going to not even consider it really so even if you've just done a couple of weeks in like a care home or just volunteering in something or like a supermarket um, and you've talked about what you've learned and you've really talked about the skills and some incidences how you dealt with specific like customers or something um, then this is much like will be much better so I think with everything it's not about what you do or the quantity it's about the quality of it um, and I think this has kind of been echoed throughout the webinar and throughout the previous webinars, um, especially last week, it's really about how you reflect on it and what you learn from it rather than what you actually do. Absolutely in agreement with you there. Um, I think definitely work experience is valuable and it's certainly something that universities want to see, that you've definitely gained a career insight into uh, dentistry. They want to also note that you've reflected upon your, on your actual uh, experiences and research so it's not only important to partake in it but also to step back and to think about what you've learned and how it's changed your view and what you found really really insightful and interesting that's actually potentially driven you further to pursuing that potential career so those are really really important and like Catherine said we we do strongly advocate reflection and ensuring that you're not just doing it for the sake of completing it Another question here is, if you've done two different dental work experience, should you compare and reflect in your personal statement? I'd try and link them together. So I worked in a dental uh, technician's lab, which is it's not a general practice, but um, it, you know, it gave me the background knowledge of dentistry and I was actually able to make a crown and a bridge. Uh, they gave me that opportunity, but I linked it together saying that it was the whole team. Um, and, you know, to see how from, from the technician, it goes back to the nurse and then the nurse to the dentist. So if you're able to link the two types of work experiences, which are dentally related, it sounds even better. In just in my opinion, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. Uh, Addy, question for you here. Um, what kind of stuff would I point out from my experience? I mean, is this um, in regards to the work experience I did? I think this is in terms of this is a generic sort of question regarding what kind of things can an individual point out during their work experience. I think, um, and um, you touched upon this a little bit uh, as well. Oh yeah, um, well, I think for work experience, I think the key is reflection, like everyone's um, touched upon. So. For me, I did work experience at three different places. I did it at the one week at a general dental practice, one week at community, and I was lucky to get one week at a MACSAC as well. Um, so what I did was at each one, I tried to analyse what the dentist was doing, but also what the dental nurse was doing, right from the receptionist as well. 
Um, even there was a bad interaction with the patient, I tried to notice how the dentist might have handled it or how the team worked together. So I don't know if I'm fully answering the question, but I think the key is just reflecting what's happening, the communication skills, even patient confidentiality, all these kind of things, and noting that down, thinking, oh, how would I have handled it in that situation myself compared to how the dentist handles it? And then you can talk about that in your personal statement and they'll probably bring up as well in your interview. So that's just reflection is the key thing. And Annam, do you want to just touch on a little bit about um, tips for reflection and things to consider? Yeah, so I would say focus on like what we mentioned, the skills that the dentist is drawing upon in their job. Um, so focus on what they're doing. So look at the way that they are dealing with the patients. Maybe you can write something, maybe you can draw similarities to how you deal with people in, norm, in, in your job or as like a head boy, a head girl, maybe you can draw similarities between that. Um, and then in terms of, so then write, so while you're having your experience, write down those experiences and write down as much as you can, write down anything that you find interesting. And then over time you will refine it and refine it and you can put it into your personal statement and draw upon it at your interview. Um, I think that's it. Really, really good, yeah. Um, we had a question here, is it necessary to do a part-time job in your gap year for it to, to not look negative? Um, so I had a gap year. Um, I, I think it's useful for you to do a job for yourself because I gained a lot from doing my job. It's not necessary, but they want to be able to, they want to see that you're using your time up, um, whether that's like a job or taking a hobby or doing volunteering, that you're not just sitting at home um, and doing nothing. But it's, it's useful to put it in your personal statement as well, that you are actually trying to achieve something. I know Raza did um, a gap year similar to me, so maybe you can add. Uh, I think yeah, it's it is useful, but it's not it's not mandatory. You might be focused on improving your A level grades, and that's been what you've hoped to achieve throughout the year. But just have an end goal, whether that's your A level grades, a personal development trait that you aim to like um, improve on, uh, physically, mentally, challenges that you may have faced during the year. Um, and if you do decide to pick up a job, make sure it's something that you're actually going to enjoy. Um, because if you're planning to do this for the rest of your year, then you might as well get a job which is um, actually going to enhance your abilities. So in Specsavers, I know that it, in regards to glasses, it seems quite basic, but you still have to like screw down and, and you know, uh, change up some frames and stuff. So that's always allowed me to work my manual dexterity throughout the year. Um, and it wasn't necessarily something I just mentioned in my personal statement. I did ha save some stuff for my interview and I'd say, you know, these are some points I'd potentially like to tell the interview about myself because um, if they're not on my personal statement and it might be useful for me to get my point across that way um, in case uh, there is a manual dexterity task at your interview. And this just a question here regarding um, interviewing dentists on Instagram. I'm going to ask Arij and Harriet about this. So, um, Arij, do you want to talk about this? And then, Harriet, you can follow on. Um, okay, so I would say it might be a bit difficult to do that because, especially during now, so they might be really busy and you they might not have time to answer all your questions. You might be able to try if you really want to, but usually on dentists, um, their pages they would have examples of cases and they would have they would write down in the caption what happened and what they did so maybe you can use that as um, kind of like work experience instead of actually interviewing them um, would you think yeah I would agree with that I don't think, think about that Harry sorry yeah I would agree with that I don't think actually asking the clinicians what their oh about their cases is a good idea there are some dental pages which are made for dentists rather than for patients um, and a couple of my good friends they post cases and um how they've done them step by step so one of them is dr aj dunner um and dr ferdy chum i'll just type them in the chat so you can go and follow them but they they put their whole cases up so you can see step by step what they do i'll just put those up now
yeah, that's really useful information. That's really, really um, valuable for those individuals. Uh, we also have a question here on if two candidates have very similar applications, but one took a gap year and the other didn't, would the candidate not with gap year be favoured? Bini, do you want to touch upon that? Yeah, Paul's right. Um, so, yeah, so Dan, it depends what you mean by that. Are you trying to say the gap year going to set you back if everyone else is exactly the same? If that's your question, then no, having a gap year should not set you back in any way, shape, or form. You should be looked at equally to another candidate if your application is exactly the same. Looking at that, as Catherine mentioned, if you've had a gap year, application wouldn't be the same because you're then going to talk about what you did in that gap year and what sets you apart. So the application would be different. So both of them should be looked at equally. The application will be slightly different. It all depends on who's reflected better, who comes across better, and who's just got more points overall. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, I agree with that. Now, we've got a really, really interesting question here. It's to do with, obviously, the fifth choice option. So we have four choices as a, as a dental applicant, and then you have a fifth, potentially a backup choice. So what did current dental students do as their fifth choice option if they decided to do one because it's optional? So would everyone want to just share what they did if they didn't do it, why they didn't do anything? Um, so in terms of, oh, sorry. Um, in terms of fifth options, um, I was just gonna say, it's not necessary to kind of put one down. What you really need to consider is, is it something you can see yourself doing, something you enjoy in a city you want to be in? And if you can't find something else that you want to do besides dentistry, then you're not required to put a fifth choice down. So personally, I didn't put a fifth choice down. I just had my four dentistry choices because when it came to looking at other courses, just nothing was appealing to me like dentistry did. Um, same as for dealer, I didn't put a fifth choice down because ultimately you should only really apply to things that you actually want to do. And I made the decision that if I didn't um, get into dentistry on my other four choices, then I'd take a gap year and reapply. So I wouldn't have taken that fifth choice anyway, but um, lots of people do put down a fifth choice and um, I think some of the others did, so they can probably talk about what sort of things they did put down. Uh, um, this year I didn't. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. <laughs> this year I didn't uh, include a fifth choice, but I did put, uh, last year when I was applying, I put dental hygiene and therapy down, um, as well as I think, uh, yeah, that was it. Um, and I thought that, if I don't get in I'll take the dental hygiene and therapy offer but I didn't because um I just you know want to do dentistry so much that it, I did, it didn't cross my mind after results day um so I was going to say I put down biochemistry as my fifth option because um I imagined that say for example I didn't get into dentistry the first time I would do biochemistry and then do dentistry as a postgrad because that's kind of what everyone tells you to do but after I thought about it I realized I would not enjoy doing three years of biochemistry and I knew ultimately that wouldn't be a good idea so I actually ended up just um, rejecting that offer anyways so that's what most people have to go through or uh, will will be told to do but like Fadila and Catherine and uh, Raza said you want to make sure that it's something that you would actually li actually like doing and for me, it seemed better to wait a year and reapply than spend three years doing something you don't want to do. But it's totally a personal, personal preference. Yeah, I can give like a different take on that as well. So I put my fifth choice as biomedical sciences at Newcastle um, because I just wanted to go to uni that bad. Um, and also, um, I actually liked what the course had to offer. Um, Newcastle has a unique scheme where after your first year, you can also transfer to dentistry or medicine. Um, so that was why I chose that as my fifth choice, um, which they still do, but it's much more competitive than when I first applied. Um, and then actually I didn't get into dentistry, so I ended up doing biomed for three years um, and it was one of the best things that I've ever done uh, before applying to dentistry. It gave me good scientific grounding. Um, it put me in a better stead for applying for dentistry um, and I really enjoyed the course. So there's definitely different ways to go about it. And I wouldn't say it was a negative thing for me personally doing it that way. I also put biomed 
down um, because similar as in Newcastle, Birmingham have a scheme whereas if you do, if you do biomed and I think if you apply you're guaranteed an interview in dentistry or medicine it might have changed um, but I think as far as I know it's pretty much the same so I did so I put biomed down as my fifth choice as a backup um, yeah um, I was similar to the others because I didn't put a fifth choice down um, if I didn't get into dentistry, I'd probably have just taken a gap year and reapplied. Yeah, I think that's, is that everyone, I believe? So in terms of the fifth, fifth choice, I hope that's clarified any um, confusion and hopefully given you some insight. One more question here. If I apply for a fifth choice at the same uni I'm applying to for dentistry, would they not give me an offer? No, that's false. Um, they go to different schools. Um, it wouldn't even be put together as the same application. So no. Thank you for swiftly clarifying that. Okay. I'm just going to scroll through the questions, but if anyone does have any further questions, we are going to be on for another couple of minutes so please feel free to quickly type your question in and then we can we can answer that well, I, just have a, oh, sorry, sorry, I, no, I was just going to say i just have a quick point about my slides and when i mentioned specific cases i meant so i think it's really important that you keep everything confidential especially when you're doing work experience in dental practice you the patients are agreeing for you to be there so when i say draw on specific cases I'm saying like trying so get rid of anything that you that people can identify the patient from any identifiable information and make sure you get rid of all of that and make it quite generalized uh, in your positive statement and in your interview because it won't be looked upon favorably if you mention any patient details um, gen in any in any setting. Following up on from what Dr. Hannam just said, I think it's quite important to conduct yourself uh, in the in like a really good manner at this um, work experience no matter what you do because uh, it's your first impression um, it equally is important as anything else in your application and I think um, in the event that the university does contact the places that you've done your work experience at you want them uh, to actually be impressed with you and you know actually be interested show interest uh, you know find things that you um, actually genuinely found interesting at the work experience that you did um, con conduct yourself professionally at all times whether that's turning up on time um, whether it's assisting the dentist in any way shape or form um, following uh, guidelines like confidentiality um, yeah so and be ethical within your approach really really useful uh, information there. Um, just had a few questions regarding the UCAT e-lessons. So I'm just going to touch upon those for a little while. Um, UCAT e-lessons are delivered by a expert UCAT tutor who, who has achieved a score of over 700 in the UCAT and has successfully coached not only dental uh, but also medical and Oxbridge um, individuals. In addition to that, they the, the, the UCAT lessons, the way that they work is you get a private link. Uh, they are a paid session. Uh, there's five sessions for the entire UCAT uh, sort of classroom. And each actual uh, classroom session is one, uh, two hours long. And in addition to that, that, you'll be covering every single aspect of the UCAT. So for each lesson, that will be dedicated to one topic. So for instance, if we just go back to the slide, you can see that for July, there's five dates. So therefore, over the five dates, you'll be covering uh, each section of the UCAT. So the first session will be the verbal reasoning. Second will be decision making, then quantitative reasoning, then abstract reasoning, then the SJT. I know we've got a few questions on the SJT and how some universities don't use it and some universities do. What we do know is that the UCAT is used by quite a lot of universities and it's quite important. You have to sit it once. You cannot retake it. This is why it's extremely important. And that's why we're offering these sessions. Um, the way it works is that we, you book on and you get all five sessions and 
you also receive a, a recording of the lesson so you can actually replay it in your own time. In addition to that, you'll be going through mini questions. You'll be actually covering tips, tricks, and strategies to boost your scores. And in addition to that, you'll also have the support and the guidance from the tutor as well uh, throughout all five sessions. So it's, they're really, really valuable. And the feedback that we've got so far is, is excellent. So what I'm going to be doing is just sharing the uh, link to individuals who are interested. If you'd like uh, to, um, to learn more about that, just send me a private message by the group, group chat. I know some of you have already done, done so. Um, and then I can talk to you about it in more detail. Just adding on from what you just said, Cal, I think uh, it's important to start early this year. We have mentioned this before, but um, it's likely that the UCAT will be considered much more heavily this year because, um, yeah, with your A-level exams, uh, you may not have the teaching facilities uh, around you to, you know, self-teach a course, but the UCAT, has, UCAT sorry, has always been an unconventional exam. It's something that the students have always had to sit and it's not in the curriculum itself. So I think there's no excuse for getting a low UCAT score uh, this year as well. Um, so I think it's good to start early, start like now would be ideal um, to make, give yourself the best chance of getting in dental school. Like don't delay it because otherwise you don't want that to be the thing, which is the reason why you have to take a gap year or do an alternative entry into dental school or find another pathway. So I think one thing uh, important to mention is start early, take up the opportunities around you um, and yeah, all the best for your application. One thing I wanted to clarify as well is that uh, we we are um, an organisation that wishes to cater for all types of individuals and we have a bursary as well. So for those individuals who who really want to take uptake this uh, the lessons, we also have a 50% off um, bursary. So if you are eligible, um, then you're, you're entitled to this. So the way to find out is if you get your phone and just scan the um, QR code, which is just on the screen here, you'll be able to look into the criteria. Um, and once you have fulfilled that, um, you just have to send us an email and then we will uh, grant you that 50% off. Now, I believe we're coming to the end of the webinar. Um, and I hope that we have been uh, I hope this has been very useful and very valuable. I'm certainly, sh if this was around when I think we were uh, applying, it would have been fantastic to have this, this sort of information available. If anyone does have any further questions and they would like to ask us anything, please don't hesitate to email us or the easiest way is probably just to send us a message through our Instagram page. And now just a reminder that we have got the book competition. So for those individuals who wish to win a free copy, please uh, just take a picture of the screen and, and then send that off um, and share that on your story. We're really grateful for your feedback and we hope that you have found it valuable. If you could share this on your screen and just let us know how you thought, uh, what your thoughts of the, the webinar was and, uh, and whether, you know, you learned anything uh, that would be fantastic um, but we are holding a new another webinar in one week's time which is actually on the subject of a sort of meeting your entry requirements and managing stress we know that you know undertaking a levels and whatever equivalent qualifications um, it can be very stressful so we're going to be covering various strategies revision tips and different resources which um, our current team have utilized to achieve the necessary requirement required grades and also touching upon stress because mental health and stress and, and the whole build-up of this can be really really stressful and we want to make sure that we can you know give you some advice and, and really useful tips to help that because it's important that you control that as well and and uh, you know we'll, we'll be covering that next week so thank you very much for for everyone for attending i think it's 8 35 now so uh we've kept you a little bit longer than promised yet again but um i hope it's been useful and thank you very very much for uh, sticking around um on that note 
I wish everyone a great evening and uh, we'll see you next week. And the link for our next webinar will be shared on our Instagram.